Hey, good afternoon. I'm Mike Beam, and I have the pleasure of serving as Secretary of the Kansas Department of Agriculture. Today is the final session in a week-long series designed to provide more insight uh, into the direct-to-consumer meat marketing business model. Uh, this session today will round out the week and tie everything together if you've been fortunate to attend our previous sessions. Uh, today, you'll learn about the regulatory considerations, services offered at the Kansas State University Value Added Meats Laboratory, and get some advice and experience from businesses that have been successful with this direct-to-consumer model. We are pleased to provide this program uh, in an educational format, uh, and I'm uh, proud of our team at the Kansas Department of Ag for putting this together and hosting. So thanks again for being on this program and I'm going to turn it over to Suzanne. Thank you, Secretary Beam. I'm Suzanne Ryan Numerick and I'm with the Kansas Department of Agriculture, Division of Agriculture Marketing. We're so glad you've chosen to spend time with us online today. I would like to review a couple of housekeeping items before the session begins. During the presentation portion of the webinar, all participant microphones will be muted. If you have a question during the presentation, please submit your question using the Q&A button or chat function at the bottom of your screen. Questions and comments will be monitored by the Kansas Department of Agriculture representatives. At any time during the webinar when asking a question, please include your name, city, and organization if applicable. Regulatory considerations that are covered today are only applicable to those operating in Kansas. For our out-of-state participants, we encourage you to reach out to your State Department of Agriculture with questions. We'll have a lot of speakers today and we'll be covering a lot of information very quickly. So today's session will be recorded and posted online. Following the session, you will receive an email that'll contain resources mentioned by speakers throughout the week. Most importantly, the email will contain a link to a survey and we personally ask you to take time to provide feedback as well as ideas for future outreach. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dana to introduce our first speaker. Thanks, Suzanne. Adam Inman is our first speaker and he is the Assistant Program Manager for the Kansas Department of Agriculture's Food Safety and Lodging Program. He has worked in various food safety roles for over 15 years. Adam serves in various roles in national food safety organizations, and he received a BS in biology from Kansas State. With that, Adam, it's yours. Thank you, Dana. Appreciate the opportunity to be here with everyone today. And just briefly gonna talk about uh, meat sales in Kansas and, and my role with the, the food safety and lodging program. And we work closely with with our colleagues in the meat and poultry inspection program. And um, I'll turn it over to, to our next speaker at, at the end of, of my presentation. So today we'll talk about why we have food safety requirements. It's always important to start with the why. We'll talk about our approach to compliance activities and get a little bit into who inspects what, because I know it can seem confusing from time to time. So of course, why we have food safety requirements is to help prevent foodborne illness as well as to protect consumers from unfair consumer practices. Um, there's quite a bit of foodborne illness that does occur every year in the United States and around the world. In the US, it's estimated that one in six Americans can anticipate to have a foodborne illness any given year. And that results in um, a lot of hospitalizations, quite a few deaths, and all of that can even wrap up into a cost of the economy. Um, of course, the numbers, are just numbers and sometimes they, they don't feel real. So I think it's important to tell stories um, of victims of foodborne illness to show how serious foodborne illness can be. And Lauren Beth's story was shared by her mother. Um, Lauren Beth was the first victim of the Jack in the Box outbreak back in 1992, 93. And um, a lot of just really, really bad things there. So I think Cooking a hamburger it can be very important, and there's a lot of people that can can be at high risk for foodborne illness. So it is important to keep those stories in mind that this is the thing that we're trying to prevent. Of course, we there there are a few people in the world that that believe that food should be unsafe. They're called criminals, 
for the rest of us, it's important to to recognize that everybody wants to provide safe food. So really, it becomes our job to to do that in the most effective and efficient way possible. So at the Department of Agriculture here in Kansas, we take the approach of um, educate, warn, enforce. We think it's important to make sure everyone understands the requirements and what's required of them, what they need to do to be able to provide safe food. Uh, we try to evaluate systems rather than trying to find specific things that little things that are wrong. We look at the whole system and say, is the system adequate to provide safe food? Of course, we encourage dialogue throughout the process. We really like to talk to folks as you have questions, as you're trying to, to make your plans, we encourage folks to talk to us to start with. Um, but just all through our interactions, we want to have good dialogue. Um, we are set up, of course, to have laws and regulations that gives us the authority to do the things that we need to do um, through that through that process. So if you want to have a little help getting to sleep at night, you might dive into some of those laws and regulations. Otherwise, you can give us a call and we'd be happy to help you answer your questions as they relate to those laws and regulations. And they're available on our website if you do want to read those yourself. Okay, so um, as Suzanne mentioned at the beginning, we, we are in Kansas, so there's some times that you might want to sell food out of, out of the state of Kansas, and particularly with meat and poultry, it gets a little bit trickier. Uh, Mike Fink was going to follow up and, and dive into that a little bit deeper. But just to give you an overview, in the United States, um, the United States Department of Agriculture Food Safety Inspection Service regulates meat and poultry products. Eggs are not poultry, that's a little complicated. It's not necessarily intuitive, but those do fall under the US Food and Drug Administration. So meat and poultry, is, which is what our, our focus is today, will be regulated by FSIS, and then in turn, um, our state meat and poultry inspection program. And my program regulates retail sales of meat as well as um, all other types of food production, um, except for dairy, which is also another program within the department. So it is a little complicated. That's, that's the way it's kind of divided nationally and Kansas reflects those divisions as well. So talking about, again, those items and, and how it's divided within the Kansas Department of Agriculture, wholesale meat sales, wholesale poultry, and then many retail sales um, of packaged inspected and passed meat and poultry products are regulated by our meat and poultry inspection program. Anyone who might be diversified and has some dairy types of functions may be working with our dairy inspection program. So I went ahead and mentioned them. And then other foods, uh, direct, a lot of direct consumer foods are gonna be covered by my program, food safety and lodging program. And believe it or not, this is the simplified flow, flow chart. And as I mentioned, uh, this, this will be recorded so you can go back and review it. Um, we could provide this to you as well if you'd like. But it's a flow chart of how do we get to um, different, which program within our department you'll be working with for a specific type of product. Contact information, I'll, I'll throw that up again later. I do want to mention our, our requirements that we have um, from a licensing standpoint, from um, regulatory facility, labeling, all of those things are geared to provide safety as well as consumer information for them to make informed decisions. So safety first, that's our goal. Keep food safe. And I also like to say to keep extra stuff out. Now, just to keep it light, I'll show you a few pictures. Um, a lot of these they, people think maybe are meat grinders. This is not, this is a nacho cheese dispenser. And these just some examples of a lot to keep in mind in, in that our business operators have to deal with. And so we are there as part of our job is to help folks remember some of those things that may not be, they may be out of sight and out of mind. So that's the, uh, a nacho cheese dispenser. Okay, the bottom yeah, one. It's really unsteady, so. Yeah, we. Hey. Those two right here. Please. That little one right there? This one? Yeah, move it. Oh my God, there's a whole bunch of them. There's a whole house in there. I'm shaking. So that was a, a retail store that had a little bit of a problem with, with a road infestation. So we were working through that with them to try to get them back into compliance and to keep that food safe. Warming. 
took a box out from under there and they're just all over. This all came from right in there and there's the two fry things and the french fry cutter up there. Um, the they're in the potatoes, they were under the bread, they're all over. And this was one of our licensed restaurants a number of years ago that had a, a problem with roaches. And so it, 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 I present these to you just to say that sometimes people either get used to some things that I think most folks would find unacceptable, things that would not be in compliance with, with the regulations, they either get used to them or they just have a different approach of it. So that's again, part of our job is to, is to keep things on, on kind of level playing field and be the eyes and ears of consumers in places that they wouldn't otherwise be. Uh, another example of, from a number of years ago was, was a food vendor, a mobile vendor that was willing to serve uh, this type of product to consumers. So again, we're out there looking out for folks. Those are, if there's any question, those are maggots on some ribs. Um, working with folks on keeping equipment clean so that we don't cause illness through contamination and just general you know, filth that people don't wanna be, be buying with their good money anyway. So that's a, that is a meat grinder in this picture. Um, you know, delivery's really taken off. So some folks were trying to get ahead of the curve on that. And uh, we do deal with all kinds of interesting things across the state. This was a wheel bearing that went out on a, on a meat truck and had a roadside barbecue. This picture, when I show this to folks, is often asked if this is a meat grinder. And this is actually a soda fountain nozzle. So again, another Another item that that an operator has to keep in mind, not necessarily with with what y'all will be dealing with, but um, just the things that my program deals with. Another soda fountain nozzle, and this actually came out of a soda fountain nozzle. So, a lot of things to keep in mind. So that's a little bit from from the perspective of my program, and I'll be around for the questions that may come up, and I think you'll get a lot more insight to the specific meat and poultry world um, from Mr. Fink. Great, thank you, Adam. We really appreciate that. And we will have time at the end for questions uh, directed to those today. So with that, um, we'll let Mike to begin uh, sharing his screen while I introduce him. Uh, Mike Fink has been a compliance officer with the KDA Meat and Poultry Program for 16 years. Prior to, he was a slaughter, slaughter floor inspector for the agency for four years. Mike is a graduate of Kansas State with a degree in food science. So Mike, if you wanna go ahead and put that in your presentation mode so we can see that, the floor is yours. As Dana said, thank you very much, Dana, for the introduction. Um, I'm Mike Fink, I'm a compliance investigator with the Department of Ag. I do have kill floor experience and I am also a food science grad. Um, I also do what they call EIAO work, which is Enforcement and Investigative Analysis Officer of HACCP plans and plants. So I do spend quite a bit of time in some plants also going over their HACCP plans. Um, our program is modeled after the federal program and we operate under what's called an equal to status. Now with that saying equal to, the only difference is we have to keep our product in the state of Kansas. Other than that, our regulations are the same, whether we are state or whether we are a federal program. Um, we operate, I always tell everybody, we operate lean and mean. We only have 33 employees right now to get the job done, and a lot of us wear numerous hats. Um, as a compliance investigator, I basically review what we call wholesale, wholesalers or distributors, and I also investigate consumer complaints and protect against economic fraud. Um, when I say economic fraud, that would be, say, a door-to-door -door salesman that was operating um, unscrupulously. I actually would enforce the Attorney General's laws, and it, which is the 50-901 series. On the other side of the, of the coin is our inspection, and we actually have an inspector in the plants every day that they are slaughter or processing under inspection. Um, again, federal versus state, really, it's all equal to, except for the fact that one our stays in state, theirs can go interstate or out of state. Um, you'll see different things, buffalo, elk, fallow deer. We actually, they are laws apply to that. But if you go to a federal facility, you always notice they charge a little extra for it. And it's because they're not amenable to their act. 
And basically what amenable means is do the laws apply? And really it doesn't take much to make a product amenable. To give you an example, say you're making a quiche um, and you sprinkle a little bit of bacon on top. All it takes is 3% raw meat or 2% cooked meat to make the product amenable to our laws. If you add ham to a, a salad, it could actually bring it underneath our laws. Now, this is really kind of confusing, but plants operate in a lot of different ways. It, they can be fully inspected. They'll be inspected during the slaughter. They'll be inspected during the processing and it'll bear the mark of inspection. Sometimes you will see no inspector come out to look at your trailer, the animal on the trailer. You will see no inspector during the processing and that's called custom or you'll see your product stamped not for sale. And that's exactly what that means, not for sale. And it goes back to the owner of the animal. Now, you can also see where sometimes they actually have a retail storefront. And you'll notice there's no mark of inspection on there. And that's really where Adam's program kind of comes into being. What they could be is either an inspected plant or a custom plant with what we call an exemption, a retail exemption. And what that means is they're bringing in inspected and past product, they're sliced, diced, and mincing it, adding ingredients, and they're putting it in their retail storefront for sale to the end consumer. So a little bit of a definition there. Now I tell everybody, if you wanna sell your meat, whether it's on Facebook or at a farmer's market or hotels, restaurants, institutions, first thing to do is express that to the plant owner. Let them know that you are going to sell this meat, that this is not your meat, you're gonna sell it. Now, it's just like I explained before, they, if they don't know it's going back to you for your personal use, they might label that as not for sale with no understanding that you're gonna sell it, okay? Now, once they actually apply the market inspection to it, there's a lot of different features of a label that you're gonna see on there. Um, sometimes people don't really realize how much goes into a label, but we actually approve every label that our plant pretty much puts out there. Um, you're gonna see a proper four part name. You'll sometimes it's shortened to a three part name as in a beef T-bone steak. You'll see the inspection legend. You'll see an ingredient statement. If it, if it needs one, um, you'll see the safe handling statement off to the right. That's actually by law, it has to be on there. You will see the statement NET WT period with a line after it, or it could have the net weight on the package. That's something you need to discuss with your processor because some, some do and some do not put the net weights on it. You can actually, that's the one thing by law can be handwritten in a label is the net weight and you have to have a certified scale and it has to be certified yearly. The signature line is basically packaged for ABC beef production. Um, again, the price per hand and, or the price per pound and the total price, that will be handwritten, hopefully on a receipt or a cash register or whatever you need to do. Um, as you can tell by our licensing, there's, we license a lot of different people in a lot of different facets of, of meat production. A wholesaler distributor, I also go into animal food manufacturers. If you're a public warehouseman, I'll come do a, a warehouse inspection. If you're a broker, then I will come visit you and review your records. Occasionally, um, inspected custom slaughter and our processing facilities I will go into to do um, basically an investigation if it leads back to there. Now, as a wholesaler, when I use the term wholesaler, you could be a wholesaler, distributor, basically it's anybody that is gonna sell meat. Now, if you're selling by the quarter half in the whole, these guidelines do not apply to you, okay? Now, the problem is you're selling the live animal in some places, and how's a good way to explain this? If it's a custom plant, you need to sell the live animal and that custom plant needs to put the name on it, okay? So anyway, we're talking about inspection all the way through it has, has the market inspection on it at this point. So the first thing to do is register with the Department of Ag as a wholesaler. You cannot break bulk unless all products have a complete label on it. All products have to be inspected and passed. So either federally or state, um, they can sold, be sold anywhere where you can get it in, HRI, hotels, restaurants, schools, daycares, um, farmers markets, um, I always tell everybody, check with your locals um, because sometimes a health department may require you to register. Um, we do require, I will show up once a year, maybe a little more if, if need be, but 
most of the time, um, as long as the facility is in a, in a sanitary manner, you have an insect or rodent control program, you have a temperature log, no dangerous chemicals stored up above, then you're gonna do all right. Um, again, you're gonna all actually keep a, a log of your freezer or your cooler temperatures. Um, we will allow you to transport fresh product or frozen, and you just need to keep it 45 or below. And then this is the important thing, keep the records that are associated with your business. You're gonna to wanna to keep receipts, invoices, temperature records. You also want to keep your receipts from the locker plant because it will tell you if we ever have a recall, it will tell me how many pounds of say summer sauce did you have or beef jerky. So it can save you the embarrassment of maybe putting your name in the paper and having to do a recall if we can get a hold of everybody. Um, I've had a lot of questions about poultry. Um, again, whether you're federal or state, we're equal to, and even the USDA allows a thousand bird exemption. Basically what this says, we're gonna allow you to slaughter and sell from the farm up to a thousand birds to the end consumer. We do not require any registration and there's no labeling requirements for that. Now, the next step up is a 20,000 bird exemption. And I always tell everybody, you always have to think about risk basis. As your risk grows, so does your basically your dog in the hunt. So we're gonna require that you're going to basically build a facility, you're going to restrict a pest, you're going to um, have water, your poultry is healthy, that you're using sanitary practices. Um, we're gonna require that you put your name, your address and an exemption number on it. So it's good, you have to jump through a few more hoops but that opens up more markets. Um, with the 20,000 bird, we will allow you go to put these at the farmer's market and to also sell some HRI. Now, I've had a question about a rabbit exemption. And we also allow 250 rabbits per year to the end consumer from your farm without any inspection. Again, sanitation is a must. So I always tell everybody it's, it's not a good thing to try to kill the end consumer. So. Anyway, definitely keep sanitation in mind and that this is a food product and somebody is gonna eat this. So anyway, as things go, you can't buy um, any rabbit products or anything like that. They have to be raised by you. Um, we're gonna allow it from, again, from your premise to the end consumer. Only healthy rabbits, sanitation and adulteration applies. Okay, um, adulteration, that's one of those things you just have to think of again, this is food and what might make this injurious to health. And if you've given it a vaccination recently, don't, um, you know, some of those have a six to eight week withdrawal time. If you have um, dirt that's blowing through a screen, that, that could give you a problem. Flies, I always say a fly is just like a flying rat to me. Um, anyway, there's a lot of things that go on to that. Anyway, how to reach us, you can reach us here. And everybody always, this is the best kept secret in the world as far as I'm concerned on how to register as a wholesaler. You can go to our website at agriculture.kansas.gov, divisions and programs, the meat and poultry inspection, click on registration, and you're gonna be a wholesaler or a public warehouseman, whatever you're gonna do. And then basically, if you're gonna to go to a farm market or wholesale, you're gonna go underneath the other tab. Um, there is a supplement page. And one of the questions that I get a lot is, what plant number is, is, do I need to use? And the plant number is usually in, in the middle of the inspection legend. Um, again, if you wanna locate a slaughter or a processing facility, you can go to agriculture.ks.gov, divisions and programs, meat and poultry, general information. The right side of the link has a link to both KDA and USDA slaughter and processors. One word of warning, um, the slaughter and processing facilities, they are fluid on how they conduct their business. So again, call them, communicate with them, let them know you're gonna sell this meat. That is the most important thing I can honestly stress to you. Um, and anyway, if there's any questions, give me a call, 785-249-1152, thank you. Great, Mike, really appreciate that. We have had some questions come in that we'll answer at the end today. So, um, and one of them's gonna be directed to you. So make sure you stay on. With that, Suzanne. Thank you, Dana. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Liz Boyle. 
who is a professor and extension meat specialist at the Department of Animal Sciences and Industry at Kansas State University. Her research and extension efforts focus on enhancing the quality and safety of meat products and providing scientific and technical assistance to meat processors and trade associations. She teaches HACCP workshops in industry um, and teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in meat processing, HACCP, and advanced HACCP. With that, Dr. Boyle. All right, thank you. You should all be able to see the screen on the PowerPoints. Hopefully that's visible to you. Thank you for the opportunity to visit with all of you today. My role in Kansas is to work with plant operators, with entrepreneurs, even with consumers who have questions related to meat, starting a meats business, um, and meat science in general. Mm -hmm. So Mike has already gone over some of the regulatory, regulatory status of the meat industry in Kansas. So I'm not going to cover those with respect to state, federal, and custom. You've all seen information on that, but Mike did talk about something called an inspection legend or an inspection bug. So if that's not something you're familiar with, it's a term that's unfamiliar to you, that's that round circle that you see on a meat package that identifies the establishment number and whether you're under USDA inspection or whether you're under state inspection, you're going to see a slight variation in how that inspection legend is formatted versus here's our not for sale stamp. A lot of people who are starting in the meat industry use co-packers. I've gotten a lot of inquiries from entrepreneurs who are interested in starting a meats business. And when that happens, the first question I have for you is, who is your market and where is your business plan? So you really need to know who it is you intend to sell your product to and have that business plan set up because the meat business is a, an expensive business to be involved in. What kind of assistance we, have, we provide to companies depends on what the company needs. So we do a lot of program components. In the past years, we've hosted different types of workshops. Obviously with the pandemic, that's changed a little bit. We offer seminars, we do one-on-one -on -one training with companies, we provide a variety of different services to companies. So let me go over those in a little bit more detail for you. With respects to workshop seminars and training, one of the most often requested services we receive is where can I get HACCP training? So if you are operating a plant, you need to have something called a HACCP plan for your product. And so we provide that training through workshops. We host on our K-State website, a list of courses that are available. We do have currently for 2021, um, or at least it should be posted, a, an in-person class, hopefully, planned for Olathe, Kansas, September 29th through October 1st. We did have that plan last year as well and had to transition it to a virtual workshop. We have one coming up in March in Columbia, Missouri. We have one planned for June in Manhattan, Kansas. So we work with a four state consortium that hosts these workshops. So you typically will see workshops hosted in Nebraska, South Dakota, Missouri, and Kansas. But all the registration now for all of those workshops will be through this website that you see posted on the slide. We do get requests specifically from companies to do company only passive trainings, but then we require a minimum of 10 people to be enrolled. And again, it's not an inexpensive workshop, it's a two and a half day workshop. And so the costs are posted on the HACCP website. We annually hold a Midwest Meat Processors Workshop. Last year, that workshop was canceled due to the pandemic. We have been hosting it 
in conjunction with the Kansas Meat Processors Association annual convention. We're currently in discussions right now with Kansas Meat Processors um, Association, other, better known as Kimpa, on what we might do this year. Right now, uh, with Riley County having restrictions on the number of people that can be in gatherings, um, I don't know whether we'll be holding one in person this year or whether we will try to do a virtual one day processing workshop. So more information will be available about that as we move through this next month. We also have done trainings related specifically to food safety on good manufacturing practices, on sanitation standard operating procedures. So if you do decide that you want to operate a plant, there are a variety of programs that will be required to be implemented in your facility over and above um, the HACCP program. We also do on-site consultations where a company will call us up and say, can you come and visit and just um, give us kind of a walkthrough, tell us what you see that we should change, what are we doing right, we're having problems with a product, can you troubleshoot for us? So we provide technical assistance with troubleshooting. Some of the services that we offer to our clients include working with companies with HACCP deviations. Mike said he looks at a lot of HACCP plans. When something is not right in that plan, a lot of times the company will be uh, told, contact Liz Boyle at K-State, she'll help you out. So we'll review HACCP plans for companies. We don't write HACCP plans for companies. My policy is, if you're going to be in this business, you need to understand what HACCP is, how the plan is developed, go to training, get that knowledge, because it's your plan for your company. And so if you develop a plan, we'll review it for you to give you recommendations on what will make a stronger plan. We'll work with you when you have a deviation, meaning something's gone wrong. Everybody has something go wrong sometime. So, if you have a product, you didn't meet your thermal processing requirement, what do you do now? So that's when we get pulled in often for that scientific input on, is this product safe? Is there something that can be done to make it safe? Or what do we need to do? We also provide assistance with nutrition facts labels. USDA permits you to develop a label using a formulation only using analytical data only, or using a combination of analytical and, uh, and uh, database values to develop a nutrition facts label. So we use a program called Genesis R&D, and I typically require people to get fat, moisture, and protein analyzed, and using data provided by the company with our, our nutrition facts labeling program, and with some analytical data we come up with a nutrition facts label for your product. Does every product need a nutrition facts label? No, it all depends on the product that you make and the volume of product that you make. If you're making a fresh product, if you're making a processed product, there's regulations all associated with nutrition facts labels. We also work with companies developing a guaranteed analysis for pet treats, fat, moisture, protein, and fiber. So we can work with you on that. We do a lot of different product analyses, depending on the product that you're making. It might be water activity, moisture, fat, and protein, often called proximate analysis. We've done fatty acid profiles for companies. We look, can look at color, sensory attributes, looking at shelf life of products, looking at microbial aspects, looking at tenderness. So we have some fee structures set up for those types of activities. And we're happy to work with you if you have questions even about what are these things and can give you information about them. We do provide a lot of technical support to companies, whether it be on packaging, whether it be on troubleshooting. Um, really, we're a resource there to help you make your business successful. And at the bottom line, everything is confidential. 
Nothing that we provide to you is shared with anyone else. So I know I get a lot of questions that might a company might say, we're reaching out to you. We don't want to get KDA involved. Nothing against you guys with KDA, but they're trying to find answers to see, are we violating a regulation? And if I say, you know what, what you're doing isn't the right thing, I'm not going to tell KDA you're not doing the right thing, but I will be there encouraging you to do the right thing. So everything is maintained on a confidential basis. This program is supported through funding from KDA. So we've been working with this agency for many, many years and have a very good working relationship with them. So I encourage you if you're in the state of Kansas, if you need help, get a hold of me. My email's posted, lboyle at ksu.edu. This is my office telephone, 532-1247. That's the direct line to my phone. I am working remotely part-time, um, but I try to be in my office at least half a day every day. So you can get a hold of me that way, uh, fax. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to work with you to help make your product and your business successful. Thank you all. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Boyle. It's time to transition into uh, what I've been looking forward to all week, and that's our panel discussion. And today we are pleased to have uh, Matt and Amy Benz. They uh, grew up in North Dakota and moved to the St. Mary's, Kansas area about six years ago to be closer to family. They're fifth generation sheep raisers and have been selling direct to consumers on a limited basis for over 40 years. And both are active in state and national sheep related organizations. Jacqueline Leffler is also joining. She's the owner of Leffler. Le that's hard to say, Jacqueline. That's a whole mouthful. Is the owner of Leffler Prime Performance in America's Kansas. In 2018, she created her value added business that markets her family's fourth generation beef cattle direct to consumer. In 2020, she saw a gap in the marketplace, took a leap of faith, a lot of risk, and marketed over 170 cattle to over 500 households. And also join us, joining us are Caden and Emily Roush of Our Family Farms, a small farrow to finish pig farm near Lebanon that specializes in Berkshire pork and is focused on outdoor production practices. They started selling their pork products under a private label in 2017 and have been a niche marketing their pork in various ways since 2008. What started as feeding friends heritage pork down the road has expanded into shipping their pork and proteins from neighboring farms nationwide every week. With that, thank you guys for joining us. And I'm gonna start out here. Um, Jacqueline, we're gonna go to you first. Um, what would you recommend for supporting resources when someone wants to start their direct-to-consumer business? Yeah, so uh, I started my business in 2015, and so it was a way for me to have a value-added part um, to our regular family farm and ranch operation. Um, it allowed another generation to come back home, and so I think First and foremost, you have to know your own bottom lines. I think a lot of people get really excited about the resources and trying to do all the research and jump onto these webinars and learn and learn and learn. But you can't move forward with anything until you know your own operation and your own bottom line. And so your finances are gonna be the most important part because if you start in the hole, you're gonna have a really hard time digging yourself out. So I would first, before you start reaching out and talking to a lot of people, um, figure out your bottom lines on, you know, whatever type of livestock you're going to try to sell that end product of, and then go from there. Great. Emily and Caden, what would you have to add to that? Um, from a uh, resource standpoint, just adding on to what Jacqueline said, uh, what we learned early on is that you have to think outside of agriculture. So a lot of us get in this business because we have farms and we're trying to find a way to generate additional revenue. But when you 
when you venture into uh, selling meat, you become a business just like uh, your Main Street businesses in town, and it opens up additional resources. So uh, there's SCORE. Uh, SCORE is a volunteer program out there that's for business owners um, that pairs you with some mentors that have been very successful in business and have retired, generally retired, and, and want to help people get started off. We've spoken with them several times. Uh, a lot of local mentorships uh, and uh, business like owners. Economic development, yes. um, your your local chamber offices, that sort of thing. You, you have to remember that you are a business. Um, you're not just farmers now. So um, I thought I'd also toss out uh, the Center for Rural Enterprise Engagement. Um, they do a lot of stuff. Um, they're located out of K-State. Um, and then from the land of Kansas as well offers um, lots of free resources there as well as some paid things and they're all great um, resources that we've taken advantage of in the last five years. Well, great. great. Matt and Amy, if you want to turn your video on, uh, you guys have been at this for, for a while and have worked with a lot of folks um, coming into the business. What would you have for some suggestions as those in the sh sheep or, or sheep and goat area? really try to get going. What are some good resources? Um, probably good, the best resources are other people doing it. Um, we have friends on both coasts of Texas in Kansas that are, can you hear me, Dana? Yes, we can, go ahead. Okay, yeah, we have, we have friends on both coasts um, that do a, a large number of lambs, over a thousand a year and uh, friends in Texas, and there's one on watching I saw that that's doing some, and uh, friends in Kansas, and I think talking to people that have done it, you know, it doesn't matter if they're in sheep or swine or whatever. I mean, that's your best resource. Well, super. Um, Emily and Caden, we're gonna roll to you guys now. Um, you've been at this for a while. What, do you have any advice on how to handle any negative reviews that you may get either on social media, word of mouth? Um, things really go quickly these days. Yeah, so uh, this is a hard question for us, but the, the real answer is it all depends on what type of negative review you're getting. Um, there's, I mean, there's a wide spectrum, whether it's product related, price related, customer service, or uh, the one that we despise the most, is a vegetarian or, or a vegan um, getting on your social media page and trying to change your beliefs. So it, it all depends on what type of negative review uh, is to how you handle it. So uh, on some of those more extreme cases, uh, sometimes it's just not worth your effort to try and uh, combat it. But when it comes down to dealing with real customers and real concerns, uh, the key is to understand our business is built on trust and customer service. So we always try to understand the customer's problems, uh, whether it be uh, a product defect or uh, some shipping mishap or something like that and work through it with them because we want them to have a positive experience to encourage them to either come back to us or uh, support other farmers in the area. Well, that's great. Jackie, as, as we roll to you, I just wanna let our participants know that if they have questions, they can sure um, add those in the Q&A function and we'll make sure that our panelists get to those. So Jacqueline, what are your thoughts on how you handle negative comments? Yeah, I think when it comes to negative comments, um, I try to rely on just two kind of principles that I follow through everything. And that's just simply making sure that you're transparent in all your answers and explaining to people that, um, especially this year, you know, I grew so fast um, and rapidly that you had to extend grace. Um, and I think if you just talk to people on the same level and you never put yourself above that you know more than the everyday consumer and that you can look at them eye to eye instead. Um, I think in agriculture, sometimes we don't do a great job of, we do a great job of educating, but I think the way we educate sometimes can be condescending to people. And so I make sure that I always just try to have good conversations um, and those conversations usually turn out perfectly fine, but you have to have a lot of patience if this is a business you want to be in because you, you get a lot of conversation, that's for sure. So some serious thick skin is needed now and then um, with reviews. Matt and Amy, do you have anything you need to, would like to add on there from folks that you have interacted with that may be getting negative comments um, when they're doing direct-to-consumer sales? 
Sure. Um, I guess my first inclination is to just say, just ignore them, probably not the best thing to do. I think that we do need to have um, open conversations and discussions and be transparent about what we do and just be positive about our industry and what we're, what we're selling because we're proud of that. We are definitely proud. Uh, agriculture does not toot their own horn that often. So we need to make sure that we do that um, with that. So um, Jacqueline, we'll roll back to you now. Um, how do you predict demand and scheduling of production of your product to, to meet the demand of your customers? Yeah, I think um, you have to be willing to look in advance, um, pay attention to what's happening in the states around you. Um, we live in a global world, so you can't just look within your county lines. You have to be able to see what's happening all around you. And for me, that's being involved, whether it's with KDA or Kansas Farm Bureau or Kansas Livestock Association. Um, I saw this coming early. Um, I kind of stepped out. My dad thought I was crazy um, when I told him what I was doing with our local butcher. Um, but it, when it came to marketing our fat cattle and being able to break even on a large scale because of direct consumer, um, sales this year, you know, it paid off, but you have to have a really good relationship with whatever processor you're going to use. Um, that's what it comes down to. I'm very fortunate to work with Allen Meat Processing in Allen, Kansas for um, all six years that I've had my business. And, you know, that relationship, they knew that I was the person in the area that was selling direct to consumer. And so they reached out to me and said, hey, we have people calling. And from there, I was able to just continue to roll. Um, but I, I know I'm realistic enough to know that I'm not going to sell 170 head this year. Um, I've worked really hard to have a model that's going to have retention, um, but it, it comes with a lot of trial and error and you're going to fail. Um, and you just have to hope that you have the money that's gonna be there to back you up when you fail because um, unfortunately a live animal can be $2,000 uh, minimum if you're talking beef. So you have to be prepared. Um, financially and time-wise as well. Well, great. Matt, Amy, I know you guys sell on, on a smaller scale with it. What do you guys do to work with to predict your demand and, and schedule it for your product? Uh, we're not nearly as advanced as or as big as uh, the rest of these people. Uh, normally what we do is when we have lambs ready to go um, with the onset of uh, Kansas farms, um, that's a tool that we use. We sell live lambs to people and deliver them to Packer, to, um, a, locker. to a locker plant. I mean, that's what we do. We, we, we give the locker the name of the person that purchased the lamb. Um, so it's mostly, when we have something ready, we'll advertise it. And, uh, and if it works for everybody, uh, it works great. And during the pandemic, when we put something on that uh, Facebook page, usually takes, I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes before we're out. I mean, people are really looking. Yeah, it was, it was, it's a good thing. Well, that's great. Emily and Caden, what can you add to the conversation? I, uh, I told Emily, if we had the answer to how to predict demand, we would be retired on a beach in Mexico. <laughs> Uh, the, what we do, um, I mean, there's a lot of analytical stuff. Uh, the first couple years out of the gate, it was a struggle. It was, um, maybe we should get this done and get this many uh, animals processed. And we have that flexibility because the packers weren't full. Uh, and fortunately, when we got to 2020, uh, we had our learning curve under our belt and understood uh, some of the cyclical nature of product and, and cuts and knew that um, I mean, everybody's in the meat game, I'm guessing, on this webinar, uh, grilling season in the summer. You know, you play to those things uh, in the pork industry. Uh, you have holiday hams. So uh, there's various things in there that after a couple of years in the business, you start to understand it's okay to set on, on certain cuts for part of the year because you're going to move them all during the holiday season or you're going to move all your bratwurst for Memorial weekend. But it, uh, it it was a big learning curve for us just trying to figure that out. Yeah, it's going to take a few years of, like he mentioned, it's very cyclical in nature. You're selling your different products. So it, it'll take a few years to figure out what cuts work, what cuts don't. Um, it's 
it's just a trial and error thing. And it probably really all depends on your location too and who your customer base is. So it's, it's a lot of feeling it out, figuring out what works best for your customers. Um, as far as predicting, that's, that's just what you, it takes time. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw one more thing in there. Uh, restaurants was a big target of ours when we started the, uh, this business because who doesn't want to have their, their meat on a plate in a restaurant? But those restaurants want, you know, 10 pork racks a week because they want to feature it on their menu as a main item. And you start doing the math on that and how many pigs it takes to supply just pork racks. And then you question, what am I going to do with the rest of this pig? And do I have the ability to sell it? So I know a lot of you just getting started have a restaurant in mind, I'm guessing, that you want to talk to. But just remember, there's a lot more to that animal than just what that restaurant wants to purchase from you. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Um, a lot of you that are participating have put in some question and answer specific to uh, meat processing, et cetera. And Mike has answered those um, with that. We don't have anything in the queue right now. So if those that are participating want to ask some questions, that would be great. Um, I am going to roll right back to you, Emily and Kaden, um, with a qu question that we have is, what are your suggestions for retaining customers? Uh, service, 100%. Um, I love to put handwritten notes in all of our and all of our orders and anything that we're shipping. Um, you're, these people are wanting to buy from you. They're wanting that connection. They're wanting that story. So why don't you give it to them? You know, um, it doesn't necessarily even have to be a handwritten note. Um, it could be like a postcard that you have made up that has like a picture of you and you know, like a sincere thank you and why we truly appreciate why you're purchasing our, our meat. So um, I really think that going that extra mile is what it is that everybody is looking for. And that's how you keep your customers. You keep them happy, um, send them an email, something heartfelt, you know, um, it doesn't have to be anything ex exuberant. Um, just let them know that you truly appreciate their business and, you know, people appreciate that. Well, great. Matt and Amy, you talk with a lot of folks um, throughout the United States. So what do you have for some tips that you may have from your friends in the industry on retaining their customers? Um, we have a friend that lives just north of Portland, Oregon, that moves uh, close to, a th well, over a thousand lambs a year right now. <clears throat> and it's all customer service. And also for them, and it's also stability of quality. They personally inspect every lamb carcass themselves. They're federally, they, they're at a federally inspected facility, but they personally inspect everything. Uh, they've graduated from, they started out at farmer's markets and went to the restaurant trade and Whole Foods and stuff like that. I mean, they were doing a really good job and then Portland got burned down and that took, that took away a lot of their uh, business and the pandemic. And they were able to switch over pretty quickly to selling halves and, and whole carcasses. And one of the things that they all say and, and people that deal with the uh, immigrant population, a lamb will fit in a, in a freezer or a half a lamb will in a, in a kitchen freezer. And that's, that's the uh, that's one of the reasons why people like to buy a half or a whole lamb because it is smaller, but at the same time, it's uh, you got ten lambs to one beef on a carcass weight, so your return isn't quite there. It's a lot more intense. Great, Jacqueline. I'll ask you to follow up on that, and then we have a couple other questions for uh, everybody that's on this call today. Yeah, the, the number one thing that I've tried to do with retention is just be relatable and likable. Um, I, I've grown connections with each person that I sell to. Um, I like to do the small touches like Emily said, whether I'm selling to 20 people or 500 people, I send a Christmas card to all of them. Um, you know, I just try to do those little small town things that my parents have instilled in me. And I, I think that's what makes, you know, Kansas farm families still lovable people to the world. I mean, the reaction that Shop Kansas Farm shows that. And 
um, you know, to it, it, you want people to feel appreciated. And so like for me, I partnered with um, another organization and we gave every single person um, that was buying bulk beef for the first time a beef cookbook this year. And so making sure you're putting in those little things along the way goes a long ways. Um, and as you grow, um, you can do more of that. Um, but yeah, just leaning on your friends too, uh, making sure that you know you can utilize them as a resource if they can fill the gaps on things that are your weaknesses to um, help that retention rate go up. So that's kind of how I do things. Well, that's great. I'm gonna now go to, to Mike and Adam. Um, this has come up a couple different times. What happens if you're at a farmer's market and someone is selling meat and it's specifically labeled not for sale. What are the processes that go with it? What calls need to be made? What does that look like? Um, I'll go first, Adam, and then you can kind of back it up. If I'm the one that goes into a farmer's market, I will actually detain that product. I actually have products that say detained. I will detain that product. Um, and then I actually build a case and the case could possibly go for criminal prosecution. So normally the first time I'll do what's called a notice of warning. But anyway, right off the bat, I detain it. That product is done. It will not enter commerce. It is subject to either being destroyed or I could, I have numerous avenues of releasing it back through your personal consumption, things like that. Um, if it Adam's people find it, we, like I say, both of our programs work in conjunction with each other. So if one of Adam's inspectors find it, a lot of times I get a phone call um, or they'll go ahead and they do what's called an embargo. And they, it's basically the same thing I do, detain or embargo are about the same. And then they'll get a hold of me and then I'll take the ball and then start the case rolling again on it. So. Yeah. And if you, you could call us, um, we take, uh, we have a web form too if you, that we can take complaints in if you have those kind of concerns um, maybe talk to the person if you're comfortable with that and and see what they um, what they're understanding they just may not understand that and they may want to just take it off sale so it's kind of your comfort level it's about that's really about um, safety of course and then level playing field for all the the folks that are in compliance with all the requirements that are in place well great I have one question left for our um, direct consumer panelists, and then we are right up against that time of day to, to finish this out. I will let you know we have some additional questions in the Q&A, and for those that we don't get answered live, we will make sure we get an answer for you. So um, let's go ahead and start with Emily and Caden, and we'll have the same question for all of you. So how do you work with and maintain that special relationship with your processor? And what happens if you have more than one processor that you're dealing with? How do you work with that um, on that relationship to make sure that everybody's good to go on this direct to consumer sales? Because all pieces and parts are really important. Yeah, so I, uh, I handle most of our processor relationships uh, and transparency. I mean, we're going to sound like an echo chamber with, uh, with dealing with customers, but it's transparency and communication. And, and I cannot stress communication enough. So there was, uh, when we got started, again, a huge learning curve because I didn't take meat science classes uh, in, in school. I, I wasn't aware that some cats canceled each other out. So there was times they said, uh, you know, I want bone-in pork chops and then yelled at the processor because there was no baby backs when it came back. But uh, we didn't yell. It was actually more of just a, a communication issue. And um, we figured that out. And to me, uh, especially in 2020 and going forward where our smaller uh, meat packers are booked full, um, they don't have to fight for your business and you need to understand that. Um, so don't, don't burn relationships if you don't have to. <laughs> Make sure you're, you're uh, being level with them and being fair and just uh, uh, using it as a, a strategic alliance. Uh, you know, you need them as much as they need you at the end of the day, uh, and you want everything to work going forward. So uh, don't get hot on a phone call with them because that's an easy way to burn a bridge. And also uh, something to remember is a lot of the times uh, the person that you're in direct communication with probably isn't their head butcher, you know. Um, so it's a lot of different uh, 
same with any other businesses. The person that might have made the cut mistake or whatever isn't actually the person that um, you're in direct communication with on a day to day basis. So, you know, they're all businesses. They've all been stressed. I think there's just you've got to give enough um, leeway on both sides to understand that we're kind of in a crazy time right now. So, um, yeah, just keep the, the line of communication open. Great. Jacqueline? Yeah, I would say um, the great way that I've been able to keep a relationship with the folks at Allen Meat Processing is just making sure that I am always the most organized person that they deal with that they're taking cattle from. And so I strive to have every Excel sheet done and ready to go. I have Excel sheets made all the way through 2022 right now. Um, I just make sure everything is neat and organized. They have all of my people's information before I deliver those animals. Um, I, you know, I probably make myself too available. I probably give away too much of my time and I know how valuable um, my time is. And in agriculture, that's the one thing we don't do well um, is pay ourselves for our time. And so, um, you know, that's the one thing I've really strived for is just being super organized, having a system, having a business model that works for both of us. Um, because without them, I don't have a business. And so, like Caden said, the last thing you want to do is burn a bridge. And if that means sometimes you have to eat something, um, unfortunately, that's just kind of what you have to do um, to continue that, you know, relationship to go well and smooth. But that's just kind of a part of you know, this type of business is there's a lot of compromise um, in more areas than what most of the time you think there would be. But, you know, scheduling is hard and sometimes you're having to deliver when you didn't think you were going to have to deliver and fit their schedule because when they're ready, your animals have to be there. So they got to keep their people busy too. If not, they can't keep their doors open. Great. Amy and Matt, what do you have for us in conclusion? Well, the little bit that we do and the way we do it, the big thing is, is identification and communication. I mean, when you're selling live animals to people and delivering them to a, to a locker plant, the animals need to be clearly identified. Uh, also, the sheep needs to be clearly identified uh, who gets which sheep, their contact information and all that stuff. So it's Basically, what everyone else has been saying is just communication, uh, keeping them lines open and and making it easy for everybody. Well, great. Thank you all for your time. And Suzanne, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Dana. And thank you um, for all of our, our panelists and our speakers, um, not only today, but all week. Uh, like I said earlier, Dana and I have had a lot of fun planning the content. We hope everyone's learned something that we hope this education outreach was beneficial to your business. We will be following up with an email that uh, contains resources mentioned throughout the week. And as I mentioned earlier, also a link to a survey. So that's important for you to fill out. We value your feedback. If you have ideas for additional outreach, we certainly would love to hear about that. And again, I just want to thank everyone who took time to join us. Uh, again, our speakers, we couldn't have done it without you. And especially Secretary Beam for allowing us uh, a little bit of flexibility and creativity uh, to make this happen. So thank you, everyone.